Climate change poses a direct threat to Navy infrastructure for the obvious reason, mm -hmm. right? They're all along on the, the coastal water. areas mm -hmm. and on the water. And it's a fact that most of Navy's land-based assets, like shipyards and bases, are right on the coastline. That's right. And to combat this, you know, never-ending environmental battle, the Navy's launching a new climate strategy. So Aaron Sikorsky, the director of the International Military Council on Climate and Security, joining us to yeah. share more insight on, of course, what this is all about. So thank you so much for being with us, Aaron. Got to ask you, you know, what are some of the main goals the Navy is doing with this whole climate strategy? What are some of the key things you guys are working on right now? Sure, no, thanks for having me. And the main goal of the Navy climate strategy is really to make sure the Navy can continue to do its core job, right, which is to protect America and keep Americans safe. And as the climate warms, as you mentioned, sea level rise at the coast or sunny day flooding on places like Paris Island where the Marines train, all of that impedes the Navy's ability to do its job. So this strategy is about building resilience to the threats that already exist, and then reducing future threats by finding ways to cut emissions as well uh, for the Navy and, and build that resilience and, and be able to com complete better missions. You know, the climate hazards are already reshaping the activities of the Navy, and more often than not, we see the military jumping in to help after uh, natural disasters. So, you know, do you think it's going to become more permanent work of the uh, Navy men and women? Yeah, absolutely. Already, I mean, we see them as first responders to humanitarian assistance and disaster relief missions, not only here in the United States after disasters, but also in places abroad in the Indo-Pacific and elsewhere. And so this strategy talks about needing to train a climate strong workforce who knows and understands how climate change will affect their day to day jobs and what they need to do differently to meet that threat going forward. Yeah. Are there other locations? You already mentioned one um, where, where they train in, in some of the climate impacts there and what you're trying to, to remedy that. Are there other, you know, maybe larger bases or locations that you're seeing significant impacts because of climate? And you're like, man, we got to act on this sooner rather than later. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the U.S., the, the largest U.S. naval base, Norfolk Naval Base in Virginia, already sees regular flooding uh, due to sea level rise and increased storm surges. And so that's a place that's really important. Also, bases in California, like Miramar, which is a marine base, where you have uh, extreme heat and risk of wildfires. We've had bases in California that have had to evacuate in, in recent years due to wildfires. And so tackling those issues are really important as well for the Navy. And then, of course, you can look north to the Arctic as well, uh, where it's not heat, but, well, it is heat, but, but it's melting ice in a cold environment uh, where there's going to be more activity. And the U.S. Navy needs to be able to operate in, in that geography as well. Mm -hmm. So really, any part of the globe. It's all places. I mean, you can't yeah, escape it, right. you know, and the Navy's everywhere <laughs> as well. So how does this new uh, strategy, sh I should say, reflect the ambitious goal of President Biden's uh, sustainability, his executive order on sustainability? Exactly. So this plan, just like the Army climate strategy, which was released in February, reflects that goal of getting to net zero for the federal government by around 2030. And so getting uh, the military bases to be resilient with things like microgrids, right, or plugging in to local power grids that are already net zero, which is at no cost to the, to the military. Uh, so that's part of it. It's about transferring equipment uh, and non-tactical vehicles to being all electric on a fairly ambitious timeline and really leading the way. I mean, the military can set an example uh, for the private sector, for the rest of the country and for other governments around the world. Yeah. And not only is it the right thing to do for the climate, it's the right thing to do for military operations as well. Because again, when we have extreme heat, right, when we have adversaries that are going after our military bases potentially, um, being more resilient and, and having those backup systems that are clean energy powered, right, renewable, is, is a way to protect uh, our bases and protect our soldiers. Do you think in our lifetime, shoot, man, not in our lifetime, probably the next 10, 20 years, do you think we'll start to see different aspects of maybe some of our naval fleet um, using less gas-powered boats and maybe going to more of a hydropower? Do you see us maybe transitioning soon? I mean, I think the innovation that we see in the, the 
shipping sector and in in the Navy as well as in the Air Force, I mean, will continue to just uh, uh, become ever more apparent. And I think that will be, again, not only because it's it's the right thing to do, but it's because it, it makes our ships more uh, able to not have to worry about supply chain challenges, yeah, right? right. <laughs> and that's the truth. Supplies. <laughs> yeah. That's so and, true. Yep. All right, yep, Aaron uh, Sikorsky, director of the International Military Council on Climate Thank you so and much. Security. Thank you so much for joining us. Some really good, good information insight. there. Yeah. yeah.